Senator, I'm going to say State Senator Linda Holmes. I, I find that on the, these State Senate calls, uh, we always have somebody who thinks they're talking to a U.S. Senator and gets really oh, confused. So. Good idea. Yep. We are dialing out now. We'll have live callers on the line in just a moment here. <clears throat> Hello, and welcome to our live telephone town hall meeting this evening. You're on the line with State Senator Linda Holm. She's your representative in the 42nd District, and she's here to answer your questions. If you'd like to ask your senator a question live in this forum, go ahead and push zero on your phone right now. We'll get you up to ask that question during our forum. We're going to go for an hour tonight, and we appreciate you being on the line. We'll also have some polling questions you'll be able to vote on using your touchtone phone, so stick around from those. We are very interested in your opinions. So once again, for those just joining the line, we'll be joined in a moment here by State Senator Linda Holmes. She's here to answer your questions. So if you have a question you'd like to ask of her, push zero on your phone right now. Otherwise, stay on the line. She'll have a few words. We'll be running some survey questions that you'll be able to vote on using your phone. And uh, if you'd like to give us your email address to get email updates from Senator Holmes, go ahead and push seven on your phone right now. And we'll get you with an operator who will take down your email address and make sure we keep you updated moving forward. I want to go through this introduction just a couple more times. We're dialing out to thousands of your neighbors right now. We appreciate your patience. Again, this is a live telephone town hall meeting. You'll be joined in a moment here by Illinois State Senator Linda Holmes. She's your uh, representative from the 42nd District to the State Senate, and she's here to answer your questions. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask live, go ahead and push zero on your phone right now, zero on your phone right now to ask a question live in this forum. We'll get you up to ask that question of your senator, and she'll be able to answer it for you. If you'd like to give us your email address so that we can keep you posted, um, go ahead and push seven on your phone right now. We'll get you an operator. We'll keep you updated um, from Senator Holmes' office moving forward. And again, we have some survey questions. We'd love it if you would participate in those. Um, you'll just uh, be able to vote on your touchtone phone, so stick around on the line for that. Now, once again, if you would like to ask a question now or at any time during this forum, go ahead and push zero on your, form, on your phone, and we'll get you up to ask that question live. Uh, the sooner the better. We want to take as many questions as possible. That's why we do this call, is to answer your questions. So once again, push zero to ask a question of your senator. Push seven if you'd like to get email updates. And uh, Senator, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Thank you so much. And I want to say to all of you on the phone, welcome. I'm State Senator Linda Holmes, and I want to thank you for joining me tonight for discussion of the issues left to be tackled by the Illinois Senate this spring. During the next hour, I'll be answering your questions and asking your opinions through some survey questions. And I just want to let you know if at any time during the conversation you'd like to submit a question, press zero. Unfortunately, I will not be able to answer every question due to time constraints. If you do not hear the answer to your question, please visit my website, www.senatorholmes.com, and submit it via email. Also on my website, you can sign up for my e-newsletter, which I give regular updates about the important issues we are facing as a community and a state. While we're waiting for more people to join the call, I'm going to talk about some of the issues we're working on in Springfield. I'll take a live call shortly as soon as more people are on the call. As a reminder, you can press zero at any time to ask a question, seven to sign up for my e-newsletter, and you can visit my website at www.senatorholmes.com at any time. Great. Thank you very much, Senator. Again, for those of you who have just joined us, you're on a live telephone town hall meeting with State Senator Linda Holmes. If you'd like to ask her a question, push zero. If you'd like to give her your email address to get e-newsletter updates, push seven. So zero for questions, seven to get updates, and we'll be running uh, some survey questions you'll be able to vote on in just a moment here. We're going to start with our first question, which came in via email before we take some of your live questions. This one's from Josie in Aurora. Uh, Senator, the question is, it seems every year there are proposals to restrict women's health care. Do you support any of these proposals that inhibit a woman to make her own health decisions? Absolutely not. I think we, particularly we as women, are certainly the best people to decide what is right for us and our bodies. So I am definitely a proponent of women having the ability to make their own choices 
especially when it comes to, to their own health, their mental health, their emotional well-being. So I, I definitely support the women's issues. Excellent. Thank you very much, Senator. And uh, once again, there are people joining the call every moment, so uh, if you do have a question, feel free to push zero on your phone at any time. We'll get you up to ask that question live. Our next question also comes via email, and it's from Katie in Aurora. Question for you, Senator, is I'm worried that with all of the budget cuts that are being made, we won't be able to properly fund education and ensure that my grandkids have the same quality of education I had years ago. Is there anything being done to find more funding for education? Do you have an answer for Katie's question? Yes, there certainly is. This is probably one of the most frequently asked questions I get, as well as one of the more complicated questions to actually answer because education funding is extremely complicated. It's also where a good portion of our budget goes to, simply because I, I think, especially in the Senate, we have always felt that our biggest obligation to our constituents is to provide a quality public education for all of our constituents. There have been many measures done in the past year to try to make sure we're, we're able to give every child, regardless of where you live, what your income level is, a good education. And that becomes very difficult when you look at some of the funding formulas. Currently this year we have what Senate Bill 16 on the agenda that is trying to address some of those inequities in order to do it. It, it basically sort of, a, this legislation is going to make it clear how much every Illinois school district should spend to educate its students based on the particular needs, interests, and abilities of the student. And, and one of the issues is that obviously we're dealing with people and we're dealing with different levels of education and, and different abilities to learn. So there is never going to be a one-size-fits-all answer to this question. But we are definitely working on a school funding reform act. And that is based on the understanding that students come to school with varying needs and abilities. And general state aid funding should be responding so that it's going to be equitable for everything. So we can at some point, this is a very long and detailed bill, but I, I definitely will make sure that as we progress with this to kind of keep everybody updated on it. will be posted on my website so people can see all the ins and outs of it. Great. Thank you very much, Senator. Again, you're on the phone with uh, State Senator Linda Holmes. If you'd like to ask her a question, please push zero. I see some of you have done that. We'll get to your live questions in a moment here. Uh, for now, we've got another email question. And a reminder, if you'd like to get uh, e-newsletter updates from your sen State Senator, go ahead and push seven on your phone right now. We'll get you with an operator. Make sure you get that e-newsletter update moving forward. Our next question comes from Martha and Aurora. The question is, I'm a retired teacher. I spent 30 years in public schools. My pension is all I have. Why are lawmakers coming after me? I didn't cause these problems. Senator? Um, this is basically an issue I dealt with the entire last session, um, and it was something I felt very passionately and very strongly about. I was a co-sponsor on Senate Bill 2404, which was the bill that we sat down, the Senate President and I sat down with representatives from all of the unions that were going to be impacted and we came to an agreement, which is the way I wanted this to happen because I completely agree with you. It is not your fault. The fault and the problems we're having with the pensions was basically because we as a legislature did not adequately fund it. So no, people should not be responsible for that. We made a promise. But because of the dire financial straits, I was very happy that so many of the unions came down and were willing to negotiate. And in fact, Senate Bill 2404 would have ultimately saved us several billion, it would have saved us, I believe, $53 billion off the um, like 30 years that it would take to get this problem resolved. Unfortunately, it was not called in the House, and they ended up passing what was Senate Bill 1, which I thought was blatantly unfair. I also think it's likely to be found unconstitutional. It is currently in the courts right now. Fortunately, it has been enjoined, which means that right now we just, we just found out it was reported today that because the bill was supposed to go into effect on July 1st, it will not go into effect. Nothing will be done on that bill until it does go through the courts and the courts come out with a ruling. 
So that's, that's the good part of this, because I think the courts are going to give us some better direction, and I, I am so hoping in this that we are not going to be taking away the pensions of the retirees and the workers who have been so dedicated to our state. And I have been very outspoken on this issue the entire last year, and I will continue to be. I, I don't feel a pension solution is fair without involving the people who are set and were promised pensions. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to take Marsha's uh, question live from the audience first. So if you'd like to ask a question live as Marsha is about to do, go ahead and push zero on your phone right now. We'll get you up to ask that question live. Marsha, go oh, ahead, thanks. please. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for doing this town hall. I think it's very important. And I don't have so much a question as a pat on the back for you and a big thank you from my husband who taught 39 years, retired eight years ago, and myself, I taught 34, retired seven years ago. And we have been so discouraged with uh, the emotional ups and downs of the pension situation because, of course, like everybody else, we we had assumed it was going to be there uh, for us in our retirement years. Uh, we started teaching, uh, it was $5,000 a year. Oh, no, my husband had a master's. He got 5200 And, uh, you know, the salaries for so many years were so low. And finally, near the end of our careers, we did a little bit better. And then to find that the potentially they're going to take away our COLA and reduce everything just to nothing, um, we found your voice to be very encouraging, and I just wanted to let you know that we appreciate that you have stood up for the teachers and the retirees. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for calling. It's always nice to hear when there's something that you feel so strongly about that there are people who agree with you on it. And, again, thank you for I, – I think it's a huge responsibility to educate our kids. So the fact that you and your husband spent years doing that and – we sort of signed a contract that said, you know, you're going to do that, you're being paid X amount of money, and these are the pension benefits you will get, and you said, okay, I'm willing to do that, and I'm going to educate your, your kids. To me, that's a contract, and it deserves to be upheld, and I'm going to continue to fight on that behalf. So, But thank you so much for calling and, and, and saying those encouraging words. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much, Marsha, and thank you, Senator. Um, we're going to go to another live question in a moment, but first we'd like to run another survey question, or our first survey question. Our first survey question goes like this. On January 1, 2015, the state's temporary income tax, inc income tax increase will expire, resulting in a $2 billion loss in state revenue, which would reduce state services and cut funding to schools. Do you support or oppose allowing the temporary income tax to expire? If you support allowing the temporary income tax to expire, press 1. If you oppose allowing the temporary income tax to expire, press 2. So again, on January 1, 2015, the state's temporary income tax, in, in, income tax increase will expire, resulting in a $2 billion loss to state revenue, which will reduce state services and cut funding to, to schools. Now, if you support allowing temporary income tax to expire, press 1. If you oppose allowing the temporary income tax to expire, press 2. We'll have another survey for you in a moment. We're going to take our next question live from Patricia. Patricia, go ahead, please. Hello. Yes, my name is Patricia Bynum. Um, I was calling about teen pregnancy. I mean, they're not even adults yet, but they're having babies, so when they get to be adults, they're still having babies. And we don't have enough schools to program them, to teach them. I mean, like, it's a woman having eight, nine, ten kids. And some of them kids out of them, 10, 4, 5 might be lost in the system. So they should cut the minimum down of kids having kids, like at least three if they're going to have be a married or have uh, at least two or three kids, maybe not five and six and seven, you know. They're grown and they even 25 got 10 kids. And the school is, you know, it's, Almost overpopulated. Ain't enough teachers. The school is overcrowded, and the, the classroom is just too many students to, to teach and everything. I think they should have like uh, these kids that have babies. If they want to, you know, not have an abortion, I would say before it happened, let them have uh, the, 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 you know, the man if they're old enough. 
so they can have their two sides so they can get some education instead of having the babies and different daddies after different daddies. Now, it's, it's wasted on all these children. There ain't enough money to go around. The government always crying they broke. But it's a lot of babies out there, and a lot of them not getting raised. All right, Senator, what are your thoughts on Patricia? Well, I, I was going to say, I think one of the most important things we have done in the past few years is we have definitely passed bills to allow for comprehensive, medically appropriate, age-appropriate sex education in the schools so that we are actually teaching our young girls and young boys a sex education so they do have an understanding and they do know how to provide protection for themselves. There has been some pushback on this because people feel that we should, you know, in our schools should not be teaching this. Now every parent does have the ability to have their child opt out of that education and also we make sure that there is a strong emphasis placed on the best, best method of preventing unwanted pregnancies and avoiding sexually transmitted diseases is to obviously abstain from sex. But if your teenagers are not going to do that, we want to make sure that they know how to protect themselves. So I think we have, a, especially in the past couple of years, there's been a very strong push towards making sure we're educating our young girls and young boys on this issue. Great. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Senator. We're going to take Jerlene's question live next, but I'd like to run another survey question for you first. Now, there have been several proposals to close corporate tax loopholes, encouraging investment and job growth in Illinois and making sure businesses pay their fair share in taxes. Do you favor or oppose an effort to close corporate tax loopholes in Illinois? Press 1 if you favor closing corporate tax loopholes, and press 2 if you oppose closing corporate tax loopholes. And press 1 if you favor closing corporate tax loopholes, and press 2 if you oppose corporate, closing corporate tax loopholes. And we'll have another survey for you in a moment. A reminder, though, uh, press 0 if you'd like to ask a question live. If you'd like to get on the Senator's e-newsletter email list, press 7. We'll get you with an operator and get your email address so you get those updates moving forward. Jerlene, you're next. Go ahead. Ah, yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, to follow up what that lady said, uh, they got to be educated in ho at home, too, uh, about talking about uh, uh, when they talk about uh, birth control for the kids. They uh, they have to educate, the, uh, you know, uh, the parents need to educate their kids to not leave that up all to the government, first of all. But my main question was I want to speak about uh, in my neighborhood, uh, his, we in a school district. I mean, when I and and people walk to school. Some some of them is walkers because that's how close we are from the school. And his people in this uh, suburb area got these pit bulls. Sometimes with, without any leash on them, and they be just running. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, people, some neighbors say they've been walking day dogs, and the dogs try to charge after them because uh, they had their dog. The owners of which was just a, a couple had two of them. They had to run and grab the leash that they, you know, heard from grabbing by the collar just to catch them from uh, attacking they dog. I got neighbors a little across the street got pit bulls. The boys out there, that's the other uh, Saturday, playing with the dog without a leash. I have a nine-year-old grandson that I keep full time. I got a, a six-year-old that I keep. Uh, on, on every uh, weekend or through the week too, sometime, and 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 uh, I was getting in my daughter's car on Friday, and these people with two pit bulls came uh, by before I got in the car. This dog was huffing and a puffing. They was wanting to you know attack me. The guy just had to let go of the leash and grab him by the collar, you know, around his neck, and that's hold him. That's to try to restrain him while I get in the car. And I asked, and I asked, I said, "What type of dogs are they?" And he wouldn't answer my question. So I already knew, though. But anyway, didn't and didn't knew about. Now, now, Jerlene, are you are you just looking to find out if there are any laws against uh, certain types of dogs being in a res residential area? Yeah, yeah, I want to know is there any law are they gonna uh, put something on the books to do this? Because my like my older my grandson got bit Friday 
uh, uh, by a attack by his friend Pitbull. All right, thanks, Jolene. Senator, um, I, I do want to say that this usually is an issue that's dealt with more at the municipal level than it is at the state level overall. I was for several years, though, a shelter volunteer, so I'm, I'm aware of some of these issues, and especially in, in our neighborhoods. And we have not actually, you know, made a law against any particular breed of dog. Most breeds of dogs are, are good unless there are owners that have, have mistreated them or raised them badly. So it's, it's usually not as much the animal's fault as it is the person's fault. But that being said, dogs outside, if you are in most suburban areas, you know, in, in, which would be my district, you are, there are leash laws. So these animals do have to be on a leash. If they're not on a leash, you can certainly talk with your local animal control or your police and they can make sure to talk with those people because animals are not allowed to run freely through the neighborhood. Absolutely great. Thank you, Jerlene, for the question. Thank you, Senator. We're going to go to our next live question from Bill, but I'd like to run another survey question for you folks first. We want to know, how do you feel about increasing the minimum wage in Illinois from the current rate of $8.25 an hour to a proposed $10.10 an hour? If you support the minimum wage increase, press 1. If you oppose raising the minimum wage, press 2. So again, uh, there how do you feel about increasing the minimum wage in Illinois from the current rate of $8.25 an hour to a proposed $10.10 an hour? Press 1 if you support raising the minimum wage. Press 2 if you oppose raising the minimum wage. We'll have another survey for you in a few minutes here, but let's get Bill's question up live next. Bill, go ahead. Uh, yes, I'm inquiring about where the uh, Senate is in the discussion of the state budget, um, where the role of the temporary tax uh, the proposals by the governor to uh, deal with uh, perhaps property tax relief as well as even uh, perhaps a cut to the municipalities and where does the $5, or $5 billion of unpaid bills fit into your budget discussions? Okay, well, uh, obviously May is always the time when the main focus down here is the budget. And the budget is uh, sort of a long process, and there are certain senators that sit on different committees, different appropriations committees, and we sort of call our, our budgeteers that are working on so many different things. So you've got both chambers, both the House and the Senate, will have people working on the budget and trying to come to an agreement. Usually the first step is to figure out what we think the actual amount of money we're going to be able to put into the budget that year is. Out of that, you start looking at what the expenses are going to be. What I think a lot of people don't realize in the budget is that most of the budget is actually numbers that we, we can't change or we can't do anything. We've got required spending. We have to make our pension payment. We've got state payroll and, and you know any of our contractual expenses. There's debt repayment. There's human services, Medicaid. And then we do always have a revenue sharing. It's called the Local Government Distributive Fund that goes to our local governments. So quite honestly, that takes up an enormous part of our budget. Then you're cut down to what is the adjustable spending, which is going to be your education, some human services, your state government and public safety issues. And, and then we've got to determine where the rest of that money is going and how it's going to be divided up. So right now they are all in talks about trying to work that out. And the interview, you know, we, we go in and we talk to all of them and say what's important in our districts, what we're, we're, we're definitely wanting to protect. I mean, certain ones of us, you know, I'll go in and say, I definitely don't want to see MAP grants cut. I, I, want, I want our kids to be able to go to college. Um, that's going to be a priority. I think early childhood education is a priority. So we get some say-so in what that's all going to be. Then they start working out the numbers. We try to come to an agreement um, and, and pass the budget. And as you know, it has to pass in the House, it has to pass in the Senate, and then it has to be signed by the governor. So it's, it's quite a long process. Great. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, Senator. 
Again, if you've just joined us, you're on a live telephone town hall meeting with your state senator, Linda Holmes. She's here to answer your questions. Push zero if you'd like to ask a question live. Push seven if you'd like to get your e-newsletter updates from the senator's office. We'll get you with an operator and get your email address and keep you updated moving forward. We're going to run our, another survey in a moment. We're going to take Charles's question live next. Charles, go ahead. Hello, yes, I'm Charles Bowen. Yeah, I'm committee man in Precinct 44 in Naperville Township. I'm a Vietnam veteran, Marine Corps, 3rd Marine Division, 68, 69, 70. And, and I just feel that uh, as far as our senators and representatives that are representing us, uh, I just feel that uh, we're, our, our economy is, is we're in the red. And and it's pretty bad. Uh, I'm uh, I'm a retired uh, IDOT worker, uh, and and me I'm I'm worried about Illinois. I'm worried about our country, our United States of America, and I don't see our flag flying uh, from people's homes. This is supposed to be the red, white, and blue country. Not, not. Uh, uh, I guess uh, at one time in 2007, the Mexican flag was flying above the American flag, the illegal aliens. All right, Charles. Thanks for that, uh, Senator. What are your thoughts on the uh, economic crisis? Well, I, I think it's it's obviously been very difficult. We we had a horrible economic downturn, and it's it's taking us a while to recover. We're still facing major challenges. Um, we've made a lot of tough decisions with our budget, both in revenue and spending. But I think what a lot of people don't realize, because the media will report things like our backlog of bills, and I'm not sure that people realize the progress we've made. We've paid down $3 billion of the bill backlog. Um, and we're we're doing a lot to spur job creation, which is really going to be the key to really getting out of the economic downturn that we're in. But I want people to understand that most of the bills now that the state owes are within 60 days. So, I mean, there was a time when we were backlogged months, and we are not at that point anymore. So it, it's, it's a tough thing to do. And, of course, you know, we go back to, and I know a previous caller mentioned the income tax situation, which is a difficult one. You know, there there has been those of us that voted for that income tax the first time, it was proposed to us and, and to all of you as a temporary tax. So now there's talk about making it permanent. I know the governor has talked about that. I did make a promise to keep it as a temporary tax, and I, I'm not in favor of extending that. But I do know we need to look at other methods of increasing revenue so we can make sure that we're taking care of the people we need to take care of. It's our obligation as a state, obviously, to make sure that we can protect education funding and we can't balance our budget by hurting low-income people, people with disabilities. I mean, any of the vulnerable people of Illinois who it's the state's obligation to help take care of and help them we need to make sure that we have the revenue there to do that also. Great. Thank you very much, Senator. And, Faye, we're going to get to your question next, but I'd like to run another survey question first. This next survey question goes like this. Recently, a bipartisan Senate committee released a report recommending the state change the school for, for funding formula, which has gone unchanged for nearly two decades. Its recommendations provide a framework for a new distribution system of state funds that more adequately and equitably provides for the needs of Illinois students and educators. Would you support this proposal? If you think yes, it's important that schools are adequately and equitably funded, press 1. If you think no, the current school funding formula is fair and equitable, there isn't a need for change, press 2. And if you're undecided, you would need to see specific legislation and know exactly how the plan would impact your local community, press 3. So again, press 1 if you think, it's yes, it's important that schools are adequately and equitably funded. Press 2 if you think, no, the current school funding formula is fair and equitable, there isn't a need for change. And if you're undecided, you would like to see specific legislation, know exactly how the plan would impact the local community, 
press 3. And again, thank you for your participation in those surveys. Faye is our next caller. Faye, go ahead, please. Yes, my question, my comment, first I have a comment for the senator. Um, I wanted to thank her for uh, my son is an African-American student down at University of Illinois in Champaign, and the, she gave, awarded my students um, a scholarship for free tuition for one year, which uh, really, really helped our family out a lot. So I want to thank her for that. But my question is, since then, that program has been discontinued and the students are no longer awarded scholarships for the state schools here in Illinois um, through the senators. And I wanted to see if there's anyone that's working on reinstating that uh, scholarship program. My son is about to complete his education at U of I in Champaign, so it wouldn't benefit him, but it would benefit so many other Illinois um, students who really can't afford to go to college. Well, first of all, let me say congratulations to your son. Um, that was one of my favorite programs that we had ever, is I loved that ability to to help out kids that were so worthy of it that needed the help in, in being able to pursue an education. One of the, the great things is, is I had an outside committee that went through all of the applications we received, and they would look at such things such as grades, and, and extracurricular activities were another big thing. I loved the kids that had gone out there and did volunteer work and, and all of that. So. And then we would look to see, you know, if, if there was a financial need. And, again, the grades were very important. And you always get a letter from the kids as to why this was so important to them. And then that committee would look at those applications, and that's how they would decide who was going to be issued a scholarship. So I never knew who was selected until the very end of the process when they would give me the ones that they had decided on. And after I got those, I always made it where I called everybody into my office to pick up and fill out the last of the paperwork simply because I loved the opportunity to meet with these kids who we were giving scholarships to. So I loved this program. Unfortunately, there were some members who had abused the, the program, and people were being awarded scholarships who were not going through that fair process. It was more of who you knew or who knew somebody or they weren't even in the district to which the scholarships were going to. And that was one of our qualifications, is in order to give a scholarship, you had to live in the district. So therefore, we did vote to, because of the, the problems with that, we voted to abolish it. And I'm very sorry about that, because I have to tell you, quite frankly, it was a program I loved. And I'm so glad I was able to help your son out, and he's now going to graduate. So congratulations to him and to you for his successful college life. Great. Thank you, Senator. And thank you very much, Faye. Our next question is going to come from Glenn. Uh, one last reminder, if you'd like to ask a question live in this forum, push zero. If you'd like to give us your email address to get e-newsletter updates from the Senator's office, push seven on your phone now. Glenn's our next caller. Glenn, go, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, Senator. My question is, has the Senate looked at the monopoly that's going on with utilities? Older people are suffering because of the fact of high cost for gas and electricity. Companies are moving in, claiming they're going to help people save money, but it and still they are fakes. And a lot of older people are suffering very, very much with the high cost of utilities and cable TV. They should be looked into by the Senate of a monopoly of these businesses that's right away with American funding that's hurting a lot of Americans. Oh, I mean, I, I certainly will say that when it comes to senior citizens, we do have a lot of programs in place that do help. 
Um, and, and I mean, especially if you're a homeowner, there are certain real estate taxes and homestead exemptions for seniors, and, and we've sort of simplified some of those processes. As far as the bills, um, to be honest, over the winter we were we were paying pretty good rates on our our, our gas bill if that's how you heat your house, and I know our electric bills have been very good. Although I had read in the paper that our electric bills may be going up um, this summer, unfortunately, right as we're using our air conditioners. But what I would like to tell any senior out there that has specific questions, because so often, too, when it comes to phone bills and cable bills, there are programs and there are things that we can do. Call my district office. At my district office, Christine is is more than happy to talk to you and answer your questions. If she doesn't have the answers, she certainly knows who to reach out to and, and talk to and find them out. So call my district office, talk to Christine, and see if she can help you out with some of the specific questions you might have. And just so everybody has that number, it is 630-801-8985. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Glenn and uh, Senator, appreciate your answer. We're going to go to our next live question from Rosa. Rosa, go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, I just want to um, thank you, Senator, for this opportunity. And um, I just want, want to ask you um, how you are going to um, make sure to protect uh, the budget for education. Um, you know, I work in the community, and, and, and I know that, like, there is not enough spots for preschool. And, um, you know, we know that um, we need to, like, really take care of those little ones that start early so we can help develop, you know, we develop and, and um, you know, get ready for school. Um, and there is not enough uh, spaces for our kids. Um so, so how how is it going to look? What do you think about that? I, I think that um, along with the governor who had an, a, what he called the Birth to Five initiative, and he had proposed increasing funding for education by $344 million next year and $6 billion over the next five years. Um, he has also called for doubling the funding for MAP grants. And I think that along with Senate Bill 16, which is working on making sure that state funds go where they're most needed so that districts that don't have as many local resources and they have more student needs are going to get more state support. And then districts that have the local resources will get less state support. So I think what we're doing with this new funding formula that we're working on is making sure that we're distributing the, the funds to districts through a sort of a consistent single formula based upon the students served and the resources that are able to be contributed. So this is really a, a hot topic and one that we are concentrating on very, very much this session and I'm sure we will continue into even next session, continue working on it. Great. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much, Rosa. Our next question is going to come from Douglas. Douglas, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Senator, for taking my question. I'm a retired teacher, and I want to know how did you vote on SB1? And the second thing I want to know is concerning that issue is the, do you see the state as a tax revenue issue or is it a pension issue? Thank you. Um, on Senate Bill 1, I was probably the most vocal no vote in the Senate. I was a proponent of Senate Bill 2404, which um, the Senate President and I were uh, co -spon co chief sponsors on that bill. That's the one that we worked out all the details with the unions and had an agreed bill. Um, I had some concerns that, that the pension issue was actually brought up because it was addressing uh, what I said was it was a budget problem, not necessarily a pension problem, because I don't think our pensions were too rich, and I think we would have been fine had we adequately funded them. Unfortunately, we had not 
adequately funded them really since their inception, so you're going back 70 years of not funding the pensions the way we should. So I was probably, like I said, the strongest vote in favor of the people who had worked so hard and were promised pensions that we don't break that contract, we don't break that, test, that trust, we make sure everybody gets what they're supposed to be getting. Now, as far as Senate Bill 1, that is currently in the courts. It is not going to go into effect um, July 1st as it was supposed to. The courts have said until they come down with a decision, nothing is being done. So your pen pension is not being impacted at all right now. And I'm hoping it will, it, it will not be. One thing I, I do want to, to let you know, and anybody that has a concern about the pensions, because this was sort of the issue I spent all last year working on, is I send out regular e-newsletter updates on pensions. So if you want to sign up for my e-newsletter, which is at www.senatorholmes.com, you will be updated. I just did an update today that talked about the courts making sure that we didn't do anything that, that until the lawsuit was finalized. So feel free to, to take a look at that and certainly you know, get in touch with me and we can talk about the pension issue. Great. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much, Douglas, for the question. Our next question is going to come from our email questions that we've gotten in, but um, I wanted to do one last call for those folks who may have been waiting and listening to the forum to give us their email address. This will be your last opportunity to give, you your e give us your email address to get those e-newsletter updates. So if you'd like to get email updates from your state senator, push 7 on your phone right now. Again, 7 on your phone right now. We'll get you with an operator and make sure we keep you updated moving forward. And our next question comes from email. It's from Mark in Montgomery. Senator, he asks, my son is about to end his second deployment in Iraq and return to Illinois. I understand many veterans are having trouble finding work. Are there programs available to help people like my son and his friends who sacrificed a great deal to protect our country? Senator? A absolutely. And, and again, First of all, let me let me say a huge thank you for your son doing this and thank you as a parent because I think you deserve just as much thanks because you're the one who has spent the sleepless nights worried about your son in his effort to make our country a safer and the, the great country that it is. So I want to say thank you to that. But I will say that we have passed a lot of legislation affecting our veterans. Um, I know I co-sponsored a bill that gave employers a 20% tax credit if they hire an unemployed veteran who served on active duty anytime after September 11th of 2001. We passed legislation that allowed vet veterans returning from active duty to obtain a hunting permit by completing online tests and bypassing field training. We've also um, supported it was Senate Bill 2167 that required universities to offer veterans in-state tuition, and that passed the Senate overwhelmingly, and it's currently in the House. We also passed an unemployment veterans tax credit, and that encourages employers to hire unemployed veterans with a 20% tax credit for businesses when they add an unemployed veteran, again, who served on active duty since September 11th. Um, that bill also includes a property tax abatement for spouses of fallen service members. And if employers want to receive the tax credit, the qualifying veteran must have been unemployed for at least four weeks during the year prior to being hired. So I just want to say there is so much. And, and for all the Illinois bashing that goes on, I have talked with veterans from other states. And the one thing Illinois really does make a very concentrated effort in is, is, is taking care of our veterans. So, again, thank you for your son and having, having that service that is such a benefit to all of us that live in this country. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark, and thank you very much, Senator. Um, we're going to go to our next question live from Adam next. But uh, once again, if you uh, joined us late and dialed in from a voicemail we left you, you're on the, a live telephone town hall meeting with your state senator, Linda Holmes. If you'd like to ask her a question, push zero, as Adam has done. And Adam is our next question. Go ahead. Hello, Senator. Thank you very much for your time. Um, 
Recently, there was an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal entitled, What is Wrong with Illinois? And it was basically summarizing that uh, the majority of the Great Lakes states have done a number of things in their state governments to improve taxes for corporations and for individuals. And they're seeing an improvement since the uh, crash of 2008, whereas the growth in Illinois has been tepid at best, as you're as you're well aware. And I wanted to know what the uh, what the temperature is in the uh, in the legislature with respect to bringing businesses back and uh, stopping the the exodus of business and and human resources from Illinois. First, first of all, I want to say there, there has always been, a, again, a little misconception because we're, we're actually not losing population in Illinois. We're just not gaining population as fast as some other states. And again, businesses are not fleeing Illinois. As a matter of fact, business growth has been on the upswing in Illinois, on, and I don't think everybody realizes that. Um, but... That is an issue I take seriously, and in my past I was a small business owner, so I will tell you that while we still have, I think we're the fourth highest state in the nation with the number of Fortune 500 companies we actually have, but I was a very small business owner, and it is the small businesses that actually employ more people than anything else. So I, I think we did some, some good things. Um, we did have a Senate bill that we made sure that new business owners um, that had to pay um, 500 to start a limited liability corporation, and under uh, this proposal that we had, the fee was going to be reduced to $39, which would be the lowest in the nation. And economic growth, you know, really says we need to do an investment in small businesses. Um, we also have a small business and workforce development task force, um, and that's identifying issues and making legislative recommendations of importance uh, um, of issues to small businesses to make sure that we will have that development and the employment growth. So the tax, task force is going to look at regulatory policies, workforce concerns, procurement policies, sustainability, access to capital, I think we finally have both sides of the aisle very, very focused on making sure that we have jobs. And the other thing we've done, and this was a bill I passed working with Aurora University, is where they are building their partnership school. And that was a public-private partnership because in order to do their STEM school, which is science, technology, engineering, and math, and they're teaching it for grades three through eight for students that have a, a, an interest in those topics. But what we have when it came to developing the curriculum is that it was some of our local companies that came in and said, we want to help develop the curriculum because we want to make sure that eventually we have problems finding trained workers, workers with the skills we need. So they're developing the curriculum. So what will end up coming out of our schools are, are kids that are able to take some of these good paying jobs. And again, that just strengthens our local economy, which makes our state, you, you know that as well as I do. If they're earning more money, they're spending more money on all those wonderful expendable things, which keeps our state and in fact our country continuing to grow. Great, thank you, Adam. Appreciate the question. Thank you, Senator. Um, and Senator, I understand you have a constituent survey you'd like to talk about with uh, the participants we have on the call tonight. Would you like to do that before our next question? Yes, I, I really do, because as, as your state senator, it's very important to me to know what direction you think Illinois should be taking to move forward. What are the issues you would like me to make sure that I focus on? So if you'd take a minute to fill out the brief survey to help shape my legislative priorities, this spring session, and, and especially, you know, if there, if there are ideas we need to flesh out next spring session, we can do that. So your thoughts and ideas can make sure that I do a better job of representing you when I'm in Springfield. So if you could, visit my website at www.senatorholmes.com and take my constituent survey because it really will help me to represent you better. 
Great. Thanks, Senator. And uh, our next question is another email question that we've gotten in. This one's from Greg in Aurora. He asks, is there talk about expanding the sales tax to services such as haircuts and pet groomers? Senator? Um, yes, there, there's always talk about a service tax. Um, has it gone anywhere or been written up into a particular bill that we're going to be looking at this session? I say that's very doubtful. I sort of am a proponent of possibly broadening our tax base, and I think I think we need to put every possibility on the table and take a look at it. You know, I don't want to just discount things out of hand. Um, I believe our governor is very committed against service taxes. I, on the other hand, kind of like service taxes because I consider them, it, it's only the users that are paying for them. I mean, if we were to put a tax on haircuts and manicures, somebody like me would be paying that money because I'm regularly having haircuts and manicures. Um, as far as things like dog grooming, don't happen to have a dog, so that's not going to be an expense that's going to impact me. So I kind of like the idea because, again, I look at it as a service tax, but I, as a user tax, but I don't see that we're going to be addressing that this session. But again, I don't want to ever throw any possibility of added revenue out because possibly if we broaden that tax base, maybe we could lower some of our other obligations such as property tax which as somebody who lives in Kendall County would love to see property taxes a little bit lower. So again, I just want to keep that all on the table and I'd love to hear from people on what their ideas are. Great, thank you, Senator. And thanks, Greg, Greg for the question. And uh, Senator, I know you also had a senior fair that you'd like to talk about for the seniors that we have on the line. Could you go ahead and do that before we get to our next question? I would have, have done senior fairs in the past and find them to be wonderful events and there's a lot of vendors there that are able to provide some great services and great information. So I do have a senior fair coming up again this summer and I'm doing it along with my two state representatives, so that's Representative Linda Tapalavia and Representative Stephanie Kifowit and we will all be together hosting a senior fair on July 23rd. We don't have a location yet, but again, for information, you can follow me on Facebook, um, Senator Linda Holmes, or again, sign up for my e-newsletter at www.senatorholmes.com. Great. Thank you very much, Linda. And we're going to take our next question from Doug. Doug, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, Adam stole my thunder about bringing jobs to Illinois, but I was wondering of those jobs, how many of them are going to be jobs that aren't going to be low-paying jobs that we're going to be able to work 40 hours, go home and spend time with our children and not have to work two or three jobs just to put food on the table? Also, I was wondering about uh, the IDPR. If we're going to uh, loosen the reins on the regulations so that uh, small businesses can uh, explode in Illinois instead of uh, you know, cutting through all the red tape there is to start a business. That's it. Well, well, yes, we're, we're definitely doing some cuts in that red tape to start a business, like I said, with the, with the um, small businesses, the limited liability corporations. We're, we're reducing fees to, in fact, the fee would be the lowest in, in the entire nation. Again, though, when we talk about jobs, I, I'm with you. I want a job where somebody can go to work, work there 40 hours a week, come home, and on this, you know, they, they can buy a house, buy vehicles, raise their kids, send them to school, give them a good education, and do that, have expendable income for those things that, you know, everybody, every household wants, you know, your computers, your TVs, and all of this puts money back into our economy. And so when I'm talking about the jobs that are being created by what we're, we're looking at with the, the STEM schools and stuff, yes. Those are jobs that employers are out there looking for people that have the skills. And we want to make sure that we can educate our workforce so that they can obtain those jobs that they need the skills. I also think that in, in past years that there was sort of this emphasis that everybody should go to college. I'm not necessarily a believer that everybody should go to college because, I, as I often say, I don't want to live in a world without plumbers. So I think there are certainly some wonderful 
skilled trades jobs that people can certainly raise a family on and make a very nice living doing. So those are the things I want to make sure that we're promoting. Great. Thank you very much, Sundar. And thank you very much, Doug. And uh, we've actually run out of time in our hour-long telephone town hall meeting. Um, if you didn't get a chance to sign up for that e-newsletter, you can go to www.senatorholmes.com, that's H-O-L-M-E-S, senatorholmes.com, to sign up for that e-newsletter. And uh, if, we, if you didn't get your question answered, you can go ahead and leave us a voicemail message if you have any other thoughts you'd like to share once we close out this call in just a couple minutes. And uh, with that, Senator, uh, do you have any closing comments for our audience? I, I do. First of all, a big thank you to everybody that called in and asked questions. And again, the, the questions you asked sort of let me know what you're interested in, which helps me as I look at you know legislation coming up so I can make sure I do the things that are going to have the most positive impact on the people of my district. So again, I'm, I'm sorry that we've run out of time. It's, it's really been an hour that went extremely fast. So anything you want to know, please go to my website, again, www.senatorholmes.com, and you can sign up for my e-newsletter or email me your remaining questions, and I'll make sure to get back to you. And at any point where you would like to set up an appointment to meet or to talk again where we have time, please call my district office. We're basically out of Springfield by, you know, the end of May, so we're, we're back regularly in the district throughout the summer, and I'm happy to set up appointments and meet with people or give you a call on the phone or you can call me. And the district office number is 630-801-8985. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate everybody being on the call tonight. You've been on with your state senator, Linda Holmes. Leave a message after the tone if you have any closing comments for us and have a great evening.